Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our Success Saturday talk. I'm um, super excited uh, to have Tim Nelson with us. Uh, I'm going to just kind of give a couple minutes for everyone to sort of join and jump on. Um, so I'm still trying to figure out this platform. <laughs> so, okay. So I see we're we're getting some viewers, so I'm going to go ahead and start. Um, so I'm uh, Doreen Wong. This is Tim Nelson. Just for uh, transparency's sake, um, Tim is <laughs> our uh, CPA, and he handles all of our personal and business taxes. Um, and we've been so, so, so grateful to him. <laughs> um, when we first started our business, I was trying to do everything from an Excel spreadsheet um, that took forever. Um, so don't do not do that. Don't don't be me. Don't do an Excel spreadsheet. <laughs> um, so Tim, why don't you go ahead and just kind of tell everyone a little bit about your background and then we have some questions for you. Hello everyone, my name is Tim Nelson. I'm a CPA, I'm located in New York. I'm right outside of Manhattan. And the way Doreen and I have met was Doreen uh, so sold on Amazon and my firm does handle everything involving e-commerce. And so there had, was a, and still is quite a demand for people who need help with their bookkeeping, as Doreen said, with tax returns, meaning personal and business. And I think then most of all, which is try, still a, you know, a little complex for everybody is sales tax. A lot of sales tax help with everybody from uh, all the states that they could sell in online to uh, you know all, all the different rules that are changing. And what my firm does is help anyone from the smallest person, doesn't matter how small they are, just getting started to the largest company with all that, the bookkeeping, tax return, sales tax, so that they're compliant and you know that that part's being taken care of so that they know that their numbers are correct and it allows i guess you the seller to do what you do best which is sell awesome so i have your um website and email if anyone would like to get a hold of tim this is how you do it um and you know and one of the things i really appreciate about tim is He's just so um, easy to talk to um, about taxes because um, there's a lot of things that can get a little scary. You know, we get so wrapped up in wanting to do business and make the sales. And then, you know, there's that little thing about paying the IRS and how much of that can you actually keep and how do we keep more of what we make. So I think that's really kind of the gist of today's conversation. Um, I do want to make a disclaimer that this is just general education that he's giving. This is not specific tax advice for you specifically. Um, for that, you should really speak to either Tim personally or your CPA or accountant. Um, so this is not tax advice. This is just general education. <laughs> um, so first question, Tim, um, because we are e-commerce um, sellers. Are there apps or platforms that we could use to keep track of our income, expenses, and write-offs? Yes, there's there's two platforms that I find most people use. The first one is the one that I use. It's QuickBooks Online. Uh, that is the best I find bookkeeping uh program out there so that it can keep track of your sales, your expenses. It, it allows you to sync basically your checking account, any credit cards you're using, PayPal, anything like that to QuickBooks Online. And it'll download all your transactions. And it allows, let's say yourself or someone like me to categorize everything saying, hey, here's your income. Here's your cost of goods sold, meaning uh, whatever you're purchasing and then selling. And then all your other expenses after that. And I find that program to be the best. Uh, it only costs ten dollars a month. You don't need anything complex by it. Uh, you know they offer different versions. You just need the cheapest version, and it will work. And again, being a CPA, I'm sure this is going to sound one-sided, but I feel like numbers are the most important thing when trying to run your business. Uh, 
you know, being able to first have your numbers correct so that, uh, you know, what, whatever you're looking at, whether it be a profit and loss statement or your balance sheet, you know, your, if your numbers are correct, that, that should be telling you something. Am I making money? Am I, are, uh, you know, am I selling my product for enough money? That, 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 that's kind of the kind of stuff that it should be telling you. Uh, the second software a lot of people use is Xero. Uh, it's online software, just like QuickBooks Online, but it's free. Uh, a lot of people use it, but it's it's where QuickBooks Online works for me because I know what I'm doing. It's very easy to use. Xero will kind of guide you through how to categorize everything. So it, it may be very useful for a lot of people where like you'll have a transaction, it'll ask you, is it an expense? What kind of expense? Where where with QuickBooks Online, I know where just to put it. I can just categorize it and move right on. Zero might be a, a better choice for you if you kind of need some guidance. Doesn't mean you're going to get everything right, but that would be a, a better software if you kind of need some help on on how to categorize things. Oh, great. Okay, so it's QuickBooks um, and Zero. Correct. Zero as in X E R O. Oh, okay. Yeah, I figured I'd throw that. <laughs> yeah. And is it um, zero.com? Yep, zero, yep, zero.com or quickbooksonline.com. That's where you can find each software. Okay, awesome. Now, um, the next most popular question we had, because we did a poll on Facebook about what would you like to ask Tim? <laughs> um, the next uh, most popular was, what are the benefits of becoming an LLC or an S Corp? And when should a small business actually consider doing that? That's that's such a great question and it's gonna be an answer. So I'm gonna I'm gonna give you the exact answer. I don't care what you read anywhere or uh, you know what everybody else is doing. This is the answer. All right, so there's an LLC and an S Corp. Both are very good. They both protect you, meaning if something goes wrong or something like that and somebody wants to turn around and sue you. They only could sue either the LLC or the S Corp. They can't sue you personally. So you yourself are protected. Great. But now let's just look at the tax side of it because that's really what we want to, uh, since we're both, you're both protect, you're protected from both, by both. You want to see, okay, what's the tax difference? What's the difference between an S Corp and an LLC? So let's assume I own the LLC. I'm by myself and I'm selling CBD oil. Great. I'm bringing in plenty of money, and at the end of the year, I have a profit of $100,000. As an LLC, I don't have to file a separate business return. And a single member LLC, meaning I'm the only owner, uh, files the business tax return on their personal return. It just goes with their personal return. So you don't have to file a separate tax return. It's just your personal return. And you take that $100,000 profit, and it goes on your personal return. And you pay normal tax on it just like any W-2 income or interest income, it all gets added together and you pay your regular tax. The only thing is that you also have to pay self-employment tax on that $100,000. That self-employment tax is about 15%. So if you have a $100,000 profit and you're an LLC, you have to pay an additional $15,000 of self-employment tax. Mm -hmm. That self-employment tax is your social security tax and Medicare tax that would that would come out of your normal paycheck. If you ever had a job and you got a paycheck and you see the first two taxes that come out of your paycheck, it's social security and Medicare. And so this is the government's way of collecting that money since you're a business owner. And it adds out to about 15%. So that's an LLC. An S Corp, which is what I always recommend everyone to be, is to be an S Corp instead of an LLC. An S Corp does file a separate corporation tax return, but there's never federal tax. So let's say you have that same $100,000 profit um, and you file your federal corporate tax return. There's no tax owed ever. You never owe corporation tax for an, on an S Corp. That, that income, though, does flow to your personal tax return, just like an LLC. So you'll pay regular tax on it, just like with an LLC. The big difference is you don't pay self-employment tax on income from an S-Corp. So you're saving that 15%, which could be a big number because if you have that $100,000 profit, you just saved yourself $15,000. Now, granted, hopefully we're all making $100,000 on our business. Great. Obviously, if you're making $50,000 or $20,000, it's a lower number, but it's still a savings. It's still a savings. So someone may ask, well, 
why won't why shouldn't I always be an S corp? Why shouldn't I always be an S corp as opposed to an LLC? Well, there's one rule uh, that's out there where the IRS says, as an S corp, you're supposed to take a reasonable amount of payroll, meaning as you, the owner, since you're not paying in self-employment tax, you're supposed to take payroll. Now, most of the companies that I have don't take any payroll, and they've been doing that for about 30 years. And the IRS has never asked any questions about it. So it's a rule that's out there, but it's not enforced. Uh, but some of you may say, mm, that, that scares me a little. I'd rather take payroll and you know maybe be compliant, not have to worry about it. Well, that's fine also. You're still going to save money there because, again, let's say you have $100,000 of profit. You're an escort. You're not paying any of the self-employment tax, so you're saving 15%. But if you have to take payroll, you're going to start paying in that 15% through payroll. Well, don't take $100,000 of payroll. Take only $20,000. So now you're paying 15% on $20,000 of your profit, and you're still getting the other $80,000 not paying that 15%. So you're still saving and following the law at the same time. That's the difference between an LLC and an S-Corp. Wow. <laughs> and so when when should a small business transition from being independent to an S Corp? They should do it right away. There's no reason, uh, there's no magic number or magic time for you to say, okay, it's time to be an S Corp. You could do it right from the beginning. The only, um, the only drawback to doing it is that let's say you're in California and you decide, okay, I'm not gonna be a sole proprietor, meaning just yourself, you're not even an LLC, you're just yourself, and now you decide to be an S Corp, uh, California has a minimum tax of $800 per year, uh, whether you're an S Corp or an LLC. So, okay, you're taking on some tax now because you formed the S Corp. Uh, if you were to do it in New York, it might only be $50. So it really depends on what state you're in, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't hesitate to form an S corp or an LLC right away. There's there's no minimum income you have to earn or anything like that. It just, again, it just protects you. It's really the protection that comes first from whatever you're selling, even though no one's ever probably been sued from selling online for all as far as I know, who knows what somebody could sue for. And it's just good to know that that protection's there. Mm -hmm. And then once you're protected, okay, then we look at the tax side on what the difference between an S corp and an LLC is there. But never too early, I, I would do it right away. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, kind of following up on what you were talking about with payroll. So, you know, when we met, we met through, you know, e-commerce kids, and it was basically uh, teens and preteens starting an Amazon business. Um, right. So a couple of questions came up in our chat um, w with this group about what if you hire um, your son or daughter um who's underage, uh, can you write off like stuff you would normally pay for them in exchange for them helping you? For example, um, like if I hired my nephew, but then I went and paid for his baseball stuff because then I say he worked for his baseball stuff. <laughs> and could I, how does that work? <laughs> That's a great question. and. Anytime any question like that comes up, which is always a good question, I always put myself on the other side of the table of an IRS agent. And let's say the IRS agent says, all right, I see you paid for uh, California Little League baseball equipment. How is that related to your business? And A, it's not. And B, oh, but I, I hired my underage nephew to work at my business to, and this is my way of paying him the IRS agent would say, absolutely not. That's wrong in 16 different ways uh, and would disregard the expense. It wouldn't allow it to you. So I would say you cannot do that. Uh, even though you can try, you could still do it, but the law would say you can't do that. Uh, how you can go about paying your, let's say your nephew, uh, you know, if, if you pay somebody $600 or less throughout the year, you don't have to issue them any forms like a 1099 or anything like that. So if it's under $600, it's a non-issue. You just pay them any number, of, you know, $400, and you don't have to do anything with it. You don't have to give them a W-2. You don't have to give them a 1099. It's fine. But if it gets over $600, yeah, we, we're running into problems. <laughs> uh, and so, you know, you, you, 
you do, you don't you can't pay for like you know a donation somewhere or something like that or you know some some something that's not related to business uh, because if the IRS were ever to come along, which odds are they're not, you know they they they, they would take that deduction away and then you'd owe tax on that amount of money. Got it. Okay. Note to self: Do not hire my nephew. <laughs> How old's your nephew? He is um nine. Yeah, you cannot hire your nephew. <laughs> Child labor laws cannot do that. Okay. Um. So let's kind of follow along on the deduction part. Um. What are some deductions that people are taking that tend to be wrong? Um. And what are some deductions that people aren't taking because they just don't know about them? That's kind of a big question. <laughs> Good. Yeah, that's fine. Let's go, let's go with your second question, the second part of the question, because that's the one I get the most as in, what can I deduct that I may not be deducting? So there's a couple of really good ones. The first one I always tell people is your car. Uh, let's say you have a car and you have car payments on it. Start making those car payments through your business, especially if you set up the LLC or the S Corp. The law is that you're allowed to deduct one car per owner. So if you're the owner and you're traveling anywhere, put your car on the business. Now, what does that mean? Okay, you have your car payment. Even if you don't have a car payment, you put the car on the business because then you have your, your gas, your car insurance, tolls, um, you know, anything with travel with the car, you can write everything off through the business. And that's an advantage because you're gonna be paying that anyway. So let's say it was originally coming out of your personal account. Now it gets to come out of your business account and it brings your profit down. It's the same money you would have been spending anyway, but you're lowering your profit, which is lowering your tax. That's a really, that's number one. That's the, even if it's not even in the business's name, if it's in your name personally, start paying it through the business. You're allowed to do that. Second thing, your cell phone or any telephones, put your cell phone through the business because I'm sure you made one business related call at some point during the day, month or year. It's just everyone uses their cell phone. It goes, it's never dis disallowed. It's allowed to be written off. I myself, hey, listen, I, I'm on a family plan. I write off the family plan. It's all there together. You just write it off. Even if there's even a, a, a house phone line, you write it off. I'm sure you're using some kind of business related phone calls and stuff like that. Um, the first part of your question, I, I I didn't quite understand. What are people writing off that they should not? Mm -hmm. The biggest mistake of what people write off, and this this is really really important because I run into this issue a lot, and it could cost people a lot of money, is that they write off their inventory before they sell it. Meaning, okay, you went out and you bought a bunch of CBD oil. You bought a ton of it, like a ton. Great, you've got all this CBD oil. You're ready to sell it. When you do your book, if you're doing your bookkeeping, you can't write that off yet. That's just inventory. It's an asset. A lot of people just write it off as cost of goods sold right away. You can't do that. You can't. You've got to write that off as an asset. I mean, you have to categorize it as an asset. And then as you sell it, you get to write it off. You get to expense it. So the biggest mistake that I constantly see is as people buy stuff that they're going to sell, they expense it right away. And if the let and let's say that's like fifty thousand dollars worth of inventory. If the IRS were to come along and take a look for whatever reason, they would disallow that write off, and you'd owe tax on fifty thousand dollars. That could be a very big number, a very big number. And so, it's something that if you're doing your bookkeeping by yourself, you want to keep in mind: Hey, I can't write off all the inventory I buy until I sell it. And that's why there's all kinds of apps out there and wait, you know, people use spreadsheets, even though mm -hmm. spreadsheets may help at that point. Keeping track of your inventory as an inventory based business is so important. It's half the battle. Knowing how much money you have in inventory and expensing it as you go along is really important. Got it. Um, there's a couple of comments in the um, chat that's going on right now live. Mm -hmm. Someone asked, so they at $600, they need to report that they paid someone. Correct. On a 1099. On a 1099. So if it was $599, they wouldn't have to. Correct. Absolutely. Okay. 
Don't have to give it to 1099. If it's somebody that's on payroll, even, even if it's $10, you have to give a W-2. This is just 1099. Under $600, you don't have to give them a 1099. Got it. Okay. I hope that answers your question. I think it was from Vicky. Got it. Um, you know what? One, one other thing on that. Remember, they, and they also have to be in the United States. If you're paying a VA that's located outside the country, you don't have to send anything. You could just expense it. You, they, they don't get 1099s if they're in the Philippines or in China or something like that outside the country. You don't have to send any forms. You can pay them as much money as you want and expense it. These are only people that have a social security number located in the United States. If they get paid over $600, they need a 1099. Got it. Oh, okay. Um, let's see. Another question that came in. What about gifts and giveaways? Um, can that be a deduction if you give them away at an event or a raffle online? What are your thoughts on that? Yep, absolutely. That's a deduction right away. You get to expense that. Even if you're just giving it away just for marketing purposes or advertising for people to try, that's an expense. So you buy, let's say, $10,000 worth of inventory but you know you're going to some conference or show and you're gonna just give that all away, you get to write it all off. That's an expense right away, which is good. That's really good because yeah, you, you wanna make sure people have your product, whatever it is, and uh, you can expense it right away. Okay, now this is a personal question. Um, so Steve and I have thought about you know, getting a camper RV and sort of traveling across the United States. Um, so he wanted to know if he put our business logo on the side of the camper. <laughs> Go ahead. If that, if that then becomes a deduction. <laughs> the, the logo itself, yes. The camper, no. I'm okay. going to be just, yeah, we, as aggressive as we all like to be, and, you know, we're all always looking for deductions, we, we've got to draw the line somewhere where we're like, all right, we're just really trying too hard. And Yeah, I would say let's hold up right there. Okay. And, but I, I like your imagination. I like <laughs> going. We're thinking here. And you know what? There's there's never a there's never a bad question, honestly, because you may be surprised with an answer. And so that's why I always enc encourage all my clients to call me or email me as much as they want. Uh, doesn't cost you anything extra because things cross your mind. Hey, you, you, we're talking business right now, but hey, I'm getting a camper. Well, I wonder if I can write off the camper. How could I? What if I put a logo on it? All right, camper, no. Uh, but, you know, it doesn't hurt to ask the question because it could help save you money. Okay. Someone asked in the comments who must also be thinking about a camper said, what if you use the camper at events? Like you are going to a festival and you're maybe selling stuff out of the camper or you use it to haul stuff to festivals. Yeah, that's a very good question. I would I would side on the side of yes, I would be you would be able to write that off because I'm kind of think of like food trucks, mm -hmm. food trucks go to festivals like that, and you can write off the food truck definitely because obviously you're selling out of there. If you're using the camper and going to yeah some kind of festival, let's say, and you set up shop w where your camper is holding all the inventory, you're selling out of the camper, you're working right in front of the camper, I would say yes, I, I could argue that point to the IRS to say, look, this is a vital part of their business. They go from show to show with the with the camper, so now it's business related because you're traveling. I would say absolutely yes. Okay, so there was a difference between my husband wanting to slap a logo onto the side of a camper and actually using the camper and going to festivals and, um, using it as a, a like place of business sort of, I guess. Correct, and I think that would be the key is that you're using it as a place of business as opposed to let's say putting a logo on the side and then going camping somewhere, <laughs> you know, all right, you're camping, great. That's really not a business expense, but right. If you're setting up shop with it at some event or whatever constantly, then I would say yes. I, I, it's more, all right, always ask, well, what I always ask is what, what would the IRS ask me? What would be their question? How am I gonna justify this uh, transaction as an expense. And hence why the festival part I, I could defend. Okay. Yay. Okay. Um, <laughs> another question was, um, so for example, I take the CBD oil personally and then I share my testimony with other people and that's usually how um, people sort of want to buy it through my testimony. So, 
because I buy it personally, can that be used as a deduction because I'm using it as a, my testimony? No, because you're not selling it. It does. What do we did like normally when you take a deduction, there has to be income that's related to it. And so if you're if you're buying CBD oil and taking it personally, you're not you're not selling anything. I mean, unless you're getting money through your testimony. That would be the only way I could see money coming in to offset the expensing of CBD oil. Uh, but m my answer would be definitely no. You can't you can't write off that CBD oil. Okay, so someone um, is clarifying my question. Thank you so much. <laughs> Says we are required to buy a certain amount of product to keep our business going um, that we use personally, and sometimes we sell um, whatever extra product we have. So does that change it? Because we we do sell product based off of our testimony, like we posted on Facebook our testimony. And then people comment and buy it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. right. That goes back to my original answer. As long as you sell it. So you're selling CBD oil. So let's say you you buy $10,000 worth of CBD oil. I'm just making up numbers here. And let's say you you personally take 8,000 of it because you need it. So great. Disregard that 8,000. But you sell $2,000 worth. That $2,000 worth you can write off against whatever you sell it for whether you sell it for 5,000 and you have a $3,000 profit, or let's say you take that 2,000 and you only sell it for 1,000, well, you get to write off a $1,000 loss. So whatever CBD oil you have to buy, whether you want to buy it or you have to, whatever portion of it you sell, you can write off through a business expense. Okay. This, I hope that clarifies that for other people. Yeah, if that was not clear, let me know and I'll explain it again. Um, let's see. Um, home office and or workspace deductions. Got it. So especially if a lot of you are e-commerce and are selling online, a lot of you may work out of your home. Uh, home office deductions is definitely allowed. And there's really basically a general rule of thumb to give a value to what your home office deduction could be. So let's say you're in a, um, what you have to do is basically look at where you are in the country and say, all right, if I rented out this whole place, how much rent would I get for it? And you, you really should try to figure out what the fair market value rent is, but you know, figure, come up with a number. And then if I rented out my, my whole house here for a thousand dollars, just making up a number, but I only use 25% of the house for my small business, well, then 25% of a thousand is $250. I can get have a home office deduction of $250 for rent per month. So that would be rent. But then also, you know, write off your internet, write off your, again, we already talked about phone. Uh, and that would be it. You know, rent kind of covers, you know, your, your light and heat and stuff like that. So I would just write off the, you know, the, the fair market value rent and then your internet and the phone if you're not doing it already. And that kind of should cover everything for a home office deduction. Okay, great, thank you. And if you, um, for the people who are watching, if you have questions, please um, post them in the chat and we can ask Tim as well. Um, oh, here's a question. Um, are there any significant changes uh, for home business deductions from the previous year, or are there things that that you're kind of hearing might come up in the future that, as a small business owner, we might want to prepare for? Yes, th th that's a great question. So this tax return year, there was one big change. If you weren't a, if you really weren't a business like a corporation or an LLC, uh, it was hard to write off your home office deductions, basically. Normally, you'd write things off on Schedule A, not to get too technical, uh, but President Trump's new tax laws took all those write-offs away. So as you needed to be an LLC or a corporation really to get those deductions. 
so that you could take your home office deduction or a- anything like that and put them on your business. It, it kind of got tricky when you weren't either an S corp or an LLC, uh, just because Trump changed some things on your on the personal tax return that took away what's called kind of home office deductions, unreimbursed business expenses if you're an employee somewhere and you you lay out money. That that kind of stuff got taken away. So it was really beneficial to be the LLC or the S corporation to uh, to be able to take advantage of all your deductions. And remember, when, when I say S corporation, I mean S corporation, not regular corporation. You never want to be a regular corporation. Only if you had like over 100 shareholders or start making $25 million a year, and I'm literally serious, $25 million a year, would you have to be a regular corporation? Never be a regular corporation. Always either be an S corporation or an LLC. Awesome. Thank you. Okay, there is a question. I think I can post it up so you can see it too. Um, sure. Okay. Um, <laughs> so I use my That's time. A good to one. Go to events like Orlando Roadshow. Can I deduct my timeshare expense? All right. So yes, absolutely. Because you're, you're really making the trip there for the roadshow. It would be like if you're just renting a room at any hotel, you just happen to have a timeshare there. And let's say that timeshare lasts a week. If you're at that roadshow for a week, you could write off the whole timeshare expense. But let's say you're at the timeshare for a week and the roadshow is only two days. All right, well, then you can only write off two sevenths of the timeshare, two days out of the week that you're there, that you're going to the roadshow. Okay, awesome. Oh, here's another question. Can you deduct meals? Absolutely. The, the, meal, the meals have to be a business expense. Meaning, all right, hey, I'm taking my client out to dinner. Great. I'm meeting with my partners or my work associates. Great. Um, Is that a line item that you kind of can throw in some extra meals there? Yes, absolutely. Let's say, you know, you go out by yourself and grab a bite. All right, you threw it it into a business expense. But yes, meals are deductible if they're business related. That's that's the rule on there. And so, you know, as you as you said, Yes, before, is there stuff that people aren't writing off that they could? That's gen- definitely one where people may throw some extra meals in there, put it that way. Got it. Okay. Um, let me just scroll through, make sure I'm hitting everyone's questions. Oh, here's one. Kind of going back to the paying someone. I pay someone to pass out flyers. Can I claim that if under $500? Yes, that's, that's that's advertising, let's say. You're paying someone to pass out flyers. You pay them under $500, so you don't have to give them a 1099, but you get you get to still deduct it. Yes, you can do that. Great question. Okay. Yeah. Doreen, let, let me bring up a question you asked me before about... Mm-hmm. Uh, about sales tax, and I thought it was a very good question when you mentioned it, about sales tax and people traveling from show to show and maybe selling at the shows, do they have to register for sales tax in every state that they sell at? And I thought that was a very good question. And just for everyone listening, yes, you would have to. Once you enter a state that you're not registered in and set up shop to sell something, by law, you're supposed to register for sales tax because you yourself have entered that state that creates nexus, not to use technical terms, but that's a big word that flies around there. You entering a state uh, gives you nexus. There's no question about it that you're supposed to register for sales tax and then charge sales tax at wherever you're selling. That's different than selling online. Uh, This the uh, assuming that let's say all your inventory is in your house, if you start selling online and shipping to other states, I would say not to register for sales tax in any state except the home state you're located in. So let's say you're located in Texas and you're gonna set up your business in your house and start shipping CBD oil all over the country to people who are buying it. 
just register for sales tax in Texas. There you're following the law. Don't worry about the other states. Only when you start getting up to the five, $10 million, well, I don't know, some huge number of sales where you're like, wow, I have sales all over the country. Uh, maybe I need to reassess where I should register for sales tax. And you know that's something you, you would want to sit down with a professional about just to make sure, hey, do I have a huge liability out there? But during that was something you had brought up earlier when you and I were chatting, just as in if people set up at expos or something like that and start selling something, by law, yes, they're supposed to register for sales tax there. Now, I guess a follow-up question to that would be, so say, for example, because um, we sell online, but it's shipped out of the um, main company uh, warehouse in Texas. So if I'm in California, someone mm -hmm. buys it off my website from New York, <laughs> it ships out of Nevada. Like, how does that work? Well, all right, so it's very important on who owns the CBD oil because there's something called drop shipping. And if it's drop shipping, meaning somebody places the order on your website, great. You turn around and tell the uh, supplier in Texas, can you please ship you know, CBD oil to New York? Uh, and then you pay them, meaning the supplier, it's the supplier's responsibility to charge sales tax, not yours, because you're what's called drop shipping, meaning you're putting a product for sale online that you don't own at the moment. They, somebody in New York buys it, you, t you turn around and buy it from somebody else and tell them to ship it to another address. That is the supplier's responsibility to drop ship. It only becomes your responsibility if you own that CBD oil already in Texas. And I'm not sure how, I guess you would be paying for shipping, I guess, if, they, if they're keeping it in their warehouse in Texas and tell them to ship it, it would be your responsibility. But the way you're describing it, it sounds like the Texas company still owns the CBD oil. Yes. They place an order with you, which is fine. You're allowed to do that. You collect the money, turn around pay the supplier who then ships it to New York. You are not supposed to charge sales tax. It's the supplier's job, uh, supplier's responsibility to charge sales tax to you. Whether they do it or do not, that's their responsibility. It never falls on you. Okay. Did that make it. sense? Was that explained all right? Yes. Is How about everybody who's watching? Did, was that a good, um, was that clear? <laughs> Yeah, definitely Google drop shipping and see if it's what pertains to you as a seller, whoever's listening. And if it is, then it would not be your responsibility to charge sales tax. Okay, great. Um, here's uh, another question. How much should we save for income taxes each month if we are selling as an individual and not becoming an LLC or an S-Corp? Sure, that's fine, and that's a good question. Uh, back to the beginning of this conversation, I, I always said, you know, having your numbers correct, meaning your bookkeeping, how much sales have you had, what your expenses uh, are incredibly important because that'll tell you what profit you're looking at, even if it's the, the, just the first three months of the year or we're, we're just finishing up June, the first half of the year. And you can look at your books and say, great, I have profit of $10,000. Okay, you can now say, all right, what's my tax rate? Uh, as an individual, let's say it's 25%. You know, and I'm just estimating. That's a, that's always mm -hmm. a guess right there of 25%. So of the profit that I have, I'm probably going to owe 25% in tax. So of the $10,000 profit, I should probably set aside $2,500 for taxes. Got it. It's always based on your profit that you're showing on your books, whether you're a corporation or not. If you're just an individual selling, which you're allowed to do as a sole proprietorship, you kind of want to save about 25%. The more you sell, the more profit you have, the higher tax bracket you go into, the more you should save. But 25 is always a good a good number. You're either going to be overpaid if you oversaved if you save that kind of money, or all right, if you didn't save enough, you, you shouldn't owe that much. But at least you're you're in the ballpark. You're not owing a, a huge number at the end of the year without having it saved. Okay, great. And 
And I guess that would be another good reason to um, really speak to a CPA about deductions to help you lower that profit as well, right? Because if you can, if you can lower your profits, um, you pay less taxes on it. <laughs> Right. Again. And so that's why we brought up, hey, put in the car, put in the telephone, put in, you know, the insurance, tolls, gasoline, stuff that, you know, you guys move around, you travel, you go to shows, stuff like that. You go to buy stuff, maybe go to expos, write all that stuff off because you're going to be paying it anyway. You got to fill your car up with gas. You've got to make your car payment. It's great to put it through the business because, as you just said, Doreen, you lower your profit, which will lower your tax, which helps. Okay, and then I've, I've heard, and I don't know if this is true, you can either write off your car and the car expenses or mileage, but you can't do both. Correct. Okay. And so some people travel a lot and the mileage number could be astronomical. And so then, yes, maybe it's more beneficial to write off your mileage, which you have to then keep diligent track of. Like, okay, I traveled 30,000 miles this year. Uh, this is what the IRS would say. Okay, where did you go? And let's let's keep track of all your mileage. And um, you know, as long as you can back it up, it it multiplies by a rate. I think it's like fifty four and a half cents per mile uh, is the rate right now. And if that totals more than your car payments and your tolls and your insurance and stuff like that, yeah, you take the mileage instead of the payments. Okay. But you know, you really have to travel to uh, to for that to qualify. Okay. Okay. So it's, it's probably safer than to lean towards taking the car deductions than Correct. It's, it's easier to prove. That's definitely okay. a thing. Because you could say, here, here's, here's the payment I made for the car. Here's the payment I made for insurance. Great. As opposed to, okay, this, this trip was to, you know, Los Angeles. We traveled 38.7 miles and stuff like that. And I know there's apps out there that do that. But, you know, that's, that's really what you would have to do. Okay. Now, when you deduct the car, can you also deduct like wear and tear and repairs to the car as well? Absolutely. Changing tires, uh, you know, anything, doesn't matter. Windshield wipers, whatever maintenance the car needs, you can write it off for anything. All the, everything, anything to do with the car, you write off. Okay. Oh, here's a question. When should we file quarterly or should we just continue to file yearly a file what uh i guess i'm assuming they're taxes okay that i'm i'm gonna guess that's sales tax because mm -hmm. any other taxes are filed yearly okay you, you know your corporation or your personal you only can file once a year sales tax can be filed quarterly it could be filed annually or it could be filed monthly but it's the state that tells you what it how frequently you have to file it's not up to you and basically your frequency has to do with how much sales tax liability you generate. If you have a lot of sales, the state doesn't want to wait a year to collect all that sales tax. They'll first tell you to file quarterly. But then when you really, really have a lot of sales, they'll start telling you to file monthly so they get their money quickly. So once you register for sales tax in any state, the state will tell you how frequently you have to file. Okay. Wonderful. Okay. Um, any other questions from people who are watching? We have about 15 minutes left. Um, or is there anything that I forgot to ask you, Tim, that we really should let people know? <laughs> that, that's a good question. Uh, you know, the, the only other thing I, I'll put out there while people may be thinking of questions is that, you know, the Internet's a great thing. Uh, there's a lot of information out there, but a lot of it's not right. I mean, as a lot of pe people may know, they, but you may Google, you know, bookkeeping or what's the best entity for me. I, this is stuff we've covered. There's a lot of stuff that isn't correct. And it, it's really important to speak to a professional. And just in my opinion, uh, as you know, there's just a lot of bad information out there. And there's a lot of people out there that call themselves accountants who don't know anything about accounting because anybody can call themselves accountants. I think it's real important to speak to a CPA. Obviously, this is a little self-serving, but you know, at least you know you're going to get the professional advice. If I went out like right now, because look at me, if I went out and wanted to buy CBD oil, I know nothing about it, absolutely nothing. I would Google it, but am I reading the right thing? No, and I'm sure the first thing you people would tell me is speak to me, you know, as in to you. You guys right. know what you're talking about. I don't. And so I'd, knowing that you guys know it, the, the smart thing for me to do 
speak to you because I know you guys know what you're talking about. So just you know, keep in mind the source of where you're getting your information from. It might not be the best best advice you'd, you'd be getting out there. Okay, great. I have more questions for you, so Go let ahead. me scroll through them. Ask for clarification on drop shipping versus affiliate commission since Hempwork collects the money. So, so what happens is, so I'm in California, you buy the oil in New York, Hempworks is in Nevada. Um, they pay online, but the platform in which they pay goes to Hempworks. It doesn't come to us. Hempwork ships it out and then we're paid a commission from that sale. So does that change kind of the answer from from before? <laughs> Regarding sales tax? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it does not change the answer. If anything, it clarifies even, even more. It sounds like Hempworks really takes care of the whole transaction. They're they're selling the product to the people because they're the people are paying the people from New York are paying Hempworks. They're not even paying you, which is Great, that, re that completely removes you from the sales tax conversation. You're earning a commission, which is you don't charge sales tax on. So you're just getting paid a commission, which is great. You don't even handle any of the money. So absolutely, you have nothing to do with sales tax. You don't have to worry about it. Awesome. Okay, here's another one. Do we need to obtain a federal tax ID? Is this done when you set up an S corporation? Yes, you would need to set, uh, obtain a federal tax ID when you set up the S Corp. So let's say I set up the S, Cup, S Corp for you. We pick out a couple of names and uh, send in the paperwork to whatever state. Once the state says, yes, here forms your corporation and says, yes, the Doreen Wong CBD oil company <laughs> is set up, here it is. Then you turn around and say, okay, let me go get my federal ID number because now my name is set up with the state. You know the name's good. It's not being taken by anybody. And then you get your federal ID number after that. Great. Um, and I think that's important to share. So when we set up our S corporation, we actually went through Tim and he he helped us with that, all of that. So, um, you know, if you have questions about setting up an S corp or you're thinking about it, you know, please definitely, you know, contact him and ask him, you know, what is maybe the best course of action for you. And I'm sure you'd be happy to help. So. Yeah, and, and guys, it, it doesn't cost any money to have questions. Again, call, email, I don't mind giving out the answer. There's no consultation fees. It just goes back to the conversation before. As as I got to know Doreen and a lot of other people who even sold on Amazon, I, I realized there's so much bad information out there and people are just getting bad advice. And you know, you guys are trying to start your business. You're trying to start and earn a living. And you rely on other people to give you answers, especially about tax ID numbers or sales tax or bookkeeping or tax returns. I don't mind talking about it and you guys saying, great, thanks, have a nice day. That's fine. At least I know you got the right answer. The worst thing in my eyes is getting an answer from somebody who doesn't know what they're talking about, you following that and getting hurt in the end. So again, as Doreen said, if you have any questions or anything like that, don't hesitate to reach out. Okay. Um... Someone asked, and I don't know if you feel comfortable sharing or if you would just rather people contact you um, on how much is it to uh, set up an escort. It, it varies from state to state, but the average is about $600. And, and that'll be for everything, meaning setting it up with the state, getting you the federal ID number, uh, filling out the S corporation election forms that have to go to the IRS in the state. It, the, the full thing so that you're fully set up. I'd hand you the paperwork. You can go to the bank and open your bank account and you're good to go. Yes, that, that was really easy. Thank you. <laughs> you're welcome. Hopefully that answered all the questions. Oh, someone <laughs> says, yes, rather go through someone who knows CBD. <laughs> so if you're going to buy yeah, to absolutely. them. And as, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Correct. <laughs> Okay, let me just take another scroll through, make sure I didn't miss anyone's question. Um, let's see.
So someone asked, this is going back to the flyers question. Right. Um, what records do they need to keep for paying someone to pass out the flyers? That's a good question. Obviously, you're just going to have the check that you write to this person. What I would do is just at least write in the memo that you uh, pay, paid somebody just to pass out flyers. Because if again, if it's under six hundred dollars, you don't have to keep any other records beside that. They're not going to give you an invoice saying, "Hey, I'm passed." Unless they do, if they give you an invoice, that's all you have to keep. You know, let's say their invoice is five hundred dollars to pass out flyers. Great, you have your check, you have your invoice. If there's no invoice, which I'm assuming most of the times there's not, you know, just write in the memo on your check, "I paid for passing out flyers," something like that. And that should be enough. The IRS won't really look at that too hard. Okay. Um. Someone said, what if you have a couple of different occupations, safety and CBD oil? I'm not quite sure what the question is in relation to, like, is it tax related? If you have multiple businesses, is that what the question is? That's a good question. Uh, what if you, I'm not sure what the question is. Okay, so if this was your question, can you clarify it? And then we'll ask Tim. Um, here's another one. Are personal meals while attending an event deducted? Absolutely, yes, especially if you're at a convention and you are you have to buy food while you're there. Yes, that, that is a business-related meal, correct. Good question. Okay. Okay, so I'm, we're still waiting to see if the other person clarifies. Okay, I heard this year the rule for meals was changed, so I was just trying to get an understanding. Um, as far as I know, the meals question, hi, sweetheart. Sorry, my daughter just waved to me. Uh, uh, as far as I know, my, the meals question, uh, the, the meals rule hasn't changed at all. You know, you, you can deduct your meals uh, if they're business related. I don't think they took that away. Okay. Oh, here's the clarification for the. I do safety for companies and I also sell CBD oil. Can I do it all under one S Corp? Yes. That, all right, that's a good question. Yes, you can. Of course you can. You can have everything go under one S Corp. Uh, the only tricky thing that can be there is if you really want to see how each one is doing individually, it'll be hard. You, you won't have two separate books to look at. Uh, you know, everything will be filed under one return. Um, you know, depending on what the numbers are, if, you're, if you don't have high sales for each one, I would say, yes, just put it under one corporation, limit your expenses. But if there's really good revenue coming from each business, I would recommend then separating it into two corporations. So it really depends on what I guess, level in the business you're doing? Are you just getting started? Keep it as one, it's fine. Uh, but you know, if, if, if sales are really revving up, you're getting, you have a lot of expenses, inventory, you may wanna separate everything out just so you can see how each uh, entity is doing. And how do DBAs work? You know, if you have like an S Corp and then can you, in this case, can she do two DBAs or it's two separate entities? Yeah, she could do two DBAs. What it really comes down to is, especially when people are looking to sell their business. So let's say this person who sells, uh, you know, uh, does safety, but also wants to sell CBD oil, uh, wants to sell just the CBD portion of their business. It gets really difficult to sell your corporation when you've got two separate businesses running through the corporation. That's why I mentioned if, if you're really just first getting started, you it's fine to just be under one corporation but as sales really start to rev up as you start to expand separate out to a different corporation especially if there's interest from other people who may want to buy into the company sell the company i may be thinking way down the line but this is what you really want to think about you want to plan uh because especially in amazon that happens a lot people are interested in buying and selling the companies and having you know things separated in each company works but it's not really that important once you first get started Okay, great. Oh, um, 
What is a DBA? We, we should... a DBA? DBA is doing business as. So let's say it's the Tim Nelson company, but you know what? As I was doing this company, I realized I, I could sell water bottles that really are uh, you know beneficial. So I could it could be the Tim Nelson company doing business as Nelson Water. And so it's still my same company, but now everyone will see Nelson Water instead of going and forming a whole new corporation called Nelson Water and everything like that, I just add a DBA to it so that I know that this company has to do with Nelson Water. Wonderful, thank Hopefully you. That You're welcome. Here's one more question, and then I guess we should wrap up. <laughs> what is the best way for tax purposes to transfer your business at death? What is the best way for tax work to transfer your business at death? Oh, that's a that's a tough one, right? That really has to do with, I would think about estate planning. Meaning, all right, a you have your will, fine. Everything I I own is left to Tim Nelson, my heir, because he's wonderful and all that stuff. Whatever. <laughs> no, but it really has to do with your will. But you know, if if you're thinking before death, bring that person in as an owner, and at least they're in involved in the business. But for somebody who's not an owner, let's say I own my own business and I want to make sure that, and which I do, all right, I have my own tax practice. If something happens to me, I have in my will that everything goes to my beloved, dearing, wonderful, great, superb wife, just in case she watches this video later. Um, <laughs> uh, I, everything goes there. So it's really your estate planning. Make sure you have it in your will that, and Put it down specifically that a ABC company is goes to whomever, and then everything will transfer to that person on so and so's death. And is there um, taxes related to that transfer, or how, how does the tax part of that work? The tax part of that works is there's an estate tax that goes on to uh, somebody's estate now. I don't have an estate. I wish I could say that all my assets are worth that I have an estate because per person, uh, you get to deduct up to each person gets to deduct up to five million dollars from their estate before you owe tax. So unless you own stuff and have cash and bonds and everything worth in excess of five million dollars per person, meaning husband, then wife. So husband's five million, wife's five million. So it actually gets up to 10 million if you're married. Uh, but let's just assume it's a single person. Unless you have assets and value of something worth in excess of five million, nobody owes estate tax. So if you if you really have stuff in, in excess of ten million dollars, you need to do estate planning. I would I would say go to an attorney who does it and stuff like that. But for the rest of us, you know, just make sure you get a will, everything, and just figure out who's getting what when you pass. And for me, everything goes to my wife. And then if my wife passes, everything go to our kids evenly. Something, you know, something as basic as that, but you, you definitely want it in writing, you know, uh, passing away without a will can be a disaster, put it that way, mm -hmm. you know, and you can just have, just have the most basic will. And again, I would re recommend somebody speak to an attorney. I'm not the pro on that, but I know tax wise, that's how it works. Okay, great. All right. It is. 959 <laughs> um and i told him that we were going to end in about an hour so let me just um put your contact information again on the screen so people can see it um and if you have any questions whatsoever you know this is how you get a hold of Tim. Um, you know, when he says he's willing to speak to you and answer your questions, there's no consultation fee. He truly does mean it. Um, and definitely take him up on his offer. Um, you know, you, you work hard to build your business and you want to be able to keep as much as you can of that effort uh, and not pay it back to the government in taxes. So um, definitely talk to whether it's Tim or another CPA before tax season starts. <laughs> yeah, basically that's a good idea. Yeah. Um, don't wait till the last minute and go. Oh, I, I need to talk to Tim. <laughs> a lot of people do, and it's it's crazy. Yes, usually the summertime is the best time to speak to a CPA. They kind of have extra time on their hands. <laughs> so I want to thank you again, Tim, for spending this hour with us. Um, just based on the comments, everyone found a lot of value 
um, and the information you shared. And um, just personally, you know, from our family, we just really appreciate um, the friendship and um, just your professionalism all the time. Um, it, it's been a true blessing to our family. So thank you. Yep. Thank you for having me on and Doreen, great seeing you. Thank you. Okay. Enjoy your rest of your Saturday, guys. Bye. Take care, folks. Bye-bye.